You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm Victor, and joining me is Sean Ryan. Hi, Victor. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you. Happy New Year. Many happy times, Victor. Uh, from this side of the world, I know you probably got the New Year a couple of years, uh, or a couple of hours later than us, but <laughs> that's the way the world rotates. <laughs> Late, but we didn't miss out. That's what counts. No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. So there, there are some things. You know, this, this is the end of the year, and normally we'd say slow time. But there's a lot of things to talk about today. There is a lot of stuff happening at the moment. You know, you and I had talked about preparing for things like year in review, and maybe that would fill time and things like this. But I honestly don't think we need to do that so much so quickly. What do you think were the highlights of 2019? Oh, highlights of 2019 in the Apple world. Um, I would say Catalina, AirPods Pro, and... I'm going to give Apple TV, even though I have some misgivings about Apple TV, and we might discuss this later on, I'll give Apple TV a, a good thumbs up so far. Interesting. I want to hear about your misgivings in a moment. I was thinking about the Mac Pro. Okay, good one. And, well, I mean, it's it's hard to deny because they've been teasing it for how many years, right? This is This has been yeah. a project that's been well-known for some time, where they just came out and told John Gruber, yeah, we're doing it. Not yeah, saying when, and, but we're doing it. Yeah, and, and even like back, if you go back to like, it was what, March when they kind of gave us a, or no, it was May actually, when they gave us a kind of a preview of it. Mm -hmm. And um, even though they told us a couple of years ago, we, it was the first visual preview we got in May. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it's one of these things where it, we, we've seen, and I said this the last time, I said, We've seen Apple use the word professional or pro to apply to a lot of different things. But here it, it shows that they still remember what pros are and what pro tasks are and what pros require. Yeah, and this, this truly does refer to the professional people. It's not a machine for your normal person at home with a, like a, just as a desktop in the house. This is truly professional. It has to be seen in that light anyway. Yeah. Absolutely. So tell me about your misgivings about Apple TV+. Plus. Okay, right. I'm going to give the, the shows that I've watched so far, there are some absolutely excellent shows, like The Morning Show, I'm giving that a big thumbs up. Servant, brilliant. Um, C, not so much. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of coming and going on that. But in total, I think launching it with just maybe 10 shows was it was it 10 8 or 10 shows they launched when when it came out and they've added a few cents um as a streaming service when you compare it to others then the content is severely lacking it's uh, you i i think they've missed out and and the interface anyway where you have the apple tv plus shows intermixed with stuff that you might have to buy so I know certain people, um, diff different people in my family who will go into it and they, they're they still having trouble kind of going, oh, I can't watch this or why do I have to buy this? Because they're in a system that they think they have a subscription to, but yet it's offering them more stuff inside it that they have to buy. And I think this lack of content, I, I, I was talking with uh, one of my colleagues at work recently and I kind of said, it's like w launching a music streaming service that doesn't have anything inside it except for something that you created yourself you've got your own 10 albums and you launch a streaming service like if you look at spotify or even apple music and everything they have a vast array of content if you look at netflix you look at amazon prime a vast array of content but with the apple tv you've got just the shows that they've created and i think that was that, that was a mistake on their part and I, I know they are looking at acquiring external content but i think it should have been there from day one this is very interesting, and it actually dovetails with some comments from Jimmy Ivan that we'll talk about mm. later. But yeah. the the point is that for years, Netflix, I mean, my, my side of viewing of this is that for years, Netflix launched without any original content. Yes. That was all syndicated stuff that they'd bought and licensed. And Amazon Prime had many things that were Prime and some things that you had to pay for. And it was all mixed in. And so you had to decide what it was that you were watching and, and figure out if it was something you had to pay for or not. And only later launched Prime Originals and still had stuff mixed in that you had to to figure out if you were paying for or not. 
So yeah. more similar to where Apple TV Plus is. But when, when I'm viewing the Apple TV Plus menus, I agree it's a little confusing. But there is, not, not in the what to watch row, but there is an Apple TV Plus row where you see just their shows. Correct, yeah. But it's easy to get off of that track and, and easy to move to things that do ask you to pay. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the confusing part for some people. And also it's it's just if if like I know they're giving this as a free subscription if you've got a new device. If you bought a device recently, you have got a year and maybe that was part of their thinking or part of the decision making in, in giving the years free is because they realized we don't have the deals done for the syndicated content yet. So maybe that's that kind of drove that side of things. But I still think that they should have there should have been a few deals done before this by now. They had time to get that done. Well, I don't know if they're even going to do those syndicated deals. What what if they just launch with original content and are building the content over time and they've just had to lay the groundwork? It'll take a long time for them to get that content in, I think. Mm, long time. One of the things that they're doing that's a little bit differently is that they are choosing not to distribute in a binge watch format. They don't drop a season all at once. They're doing it weekly. And this is this is one of the things that Netflix has had to grapple with and that Amazon Prime has had to grapple with, which is when you drop things all at once, people tend to watch all at once. And then you don't build any chance for discussion or community around a show. Yeah, it takes the anticipation away, like the, the excitement of what's coming next week. It takes that away from it. Yes, well, I agree on that. Just, yeah. just talking with colleagues at work, right? If you were at work mm. and discussing shows with them, how do you know that they're in the same place as you or not? Yeah. Yeah, because they're, if you've binge watched 10 episodes and they've only gotten five done, then you're, you're talking, uh, you're, you're having to caveat everything with a spoiler alert or then you just don't talk about it. Right. It, but But weekly you can talk about what happened on the last episode. Yeah. So there's there's definitely something to this. I think with as many shows as they're renewing and as many shows as they're talking about launching, that it's going to continue to work for them. And I also think that if they continue to give away the year-free subscription based on purchase of product, that they'll continue to build an audience for it. Oh, they, def they most definitely will. And I... I, I kind of wondering if come next year like I've got my year's free subscription now I'm thinking next year if I buy another device closer to my renewal time will I get another year with it or do I become a paying member at that stage it's it's an interesting question and um, I I hope that they I, it's entirely possible they don't but you know you need to have a a family model the same way that they have a family model for Apple Music. You need to have a um, a a way for people to keep going and building subscription numbers for them. And even if those aren't paid subs, they, they still need to keep boosting that. And by allowing the free subscription for device, that certainly works for it. Disney did the same thing, right? Disney Plus with the, the Mandalorian. They in the US have partnered with Verizon so that every Verizon subscriber gets a free subscription for a year. Yeah, and over here in Ireland, um, Air have partnered with Amazon now as well. So if you get your your broadband and your TV subscription through Air, you get your Amazon Prime Video for a year as well. So they all seem to be going along this model now of, of bundling with the with the carriers, the traditional carriers. Yeah, and even when they're not, mm -hmm. uh, Disney Plus, ESPN, and Hulu Plus. Mm -hmm. All as a bundle is twelve ninety nine a month. Mm. I actually think, and I, I know William actually. I think William wrote an article on AppleInsider dot com about this. Was about the the the, uh, the idea of a premium subscription with Apple, whereby you get everything bundled together. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that yeah. idea. The yeah. and, and it hasn't come to pass, but it it would be no. intriguing, right? You know, if you had yeah. music, television, and Apple Arcade, for example. Yeah, and the News Plus maybe as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, everything and all in, and a good iCloud subscription then, storage subscription all in one. I'd go for that. I I, iCloud storage do. has yet to, has is one where Apple has still seemed behind on picking up on price and and storage value, right? What the right ratio is for price per storage. Yeah. Mm. And 
my hope is that that changes, especially with the secure video storage as a part of HomeKit. Yeah, they they do need to review the whole lot and and it may be as part of I, I know there are rumors out there about this coming this this premium subscription coming uh, all in one and I think they would have to do that as part of it is to just go with a complete and utter review of every aspect of it but if the price is right might be the first to jump onto it I think one of the things that happens is that these services are all coming from so many different groups at Apple that it may be difficult for them to put their heads together I, I, well, they're usually Apple are usually good at, yeah, at integrating stuff historically yeah. maybe but it's mm. it's one of those things that I remain a little skeptical of with you, you know this this kind of direction is going to come from someone like Phil that's yes. that's how this is going to have to happen if it's going to happen because otherwise it's it's uh, too many divided heads yeah yeah okay so anything else in 2019 that was high on the list for you no nothing at Besides all we didn't really discuss much about the mac pro there beside it being the like a I device mean, for pros it's it's big it's fast it's capable it's got tons yeah. of slots it does stuff super fast especially if you're doing uh apple's formats and have the afterburner card installed yeah you know if you don't take advantage of the afterburner card you can make the fan spin up and make things take atrocious numbers of hours but it's it's designed around a couple of different workflows I think is the yeah, way to, to think about afterburner. I think for people in the industry that require one of these, it's a game changer for them. And it's going to be a massive time and money saver for everybody in that industry. Yeah. You know, the one thing we didn't mention was the 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro. Actually, yeah. No, I haven't actually used one of these yet. Uh, but by what they've done with it, it looks like they got this right. I think they really did get this right. The, the screen size, everything. It looks like a perfect device. So how quickly do you think the keyboard migrates to other models? Within within the next three to four months, I would say. Really? So yeah. that's a complete yeah. refresh on the 13-inch. It's a complete refresh on the MacBook Air. Well, we did have, um, we did have a refresh. I'm trying to think what month it was in 2019 i know there was a refresh on the macbooks earlier in 2019 wasn't it um, mm -hmm. yeah and i would say simply because of the issues they had with the keyboards i think they're going to have to do a refresh on them i think that comes down to supply chain which of course we know that tim cook is a master of and it comes down to how many are in production how many are in the the uh, distribution chain and that the the relaunch will happen when those models are somewhat exhausted because they don't like having any used stock or any old stock on hand. No, and that's one thing that he is, as you say, he is the perfect. He has this absolute perfect science, plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, and he's he's the king of it. Huh? Yeah. Mm. I still think it'll it'll happen as fast as they can make it happen. Interesting. Well, we will wait and find out if that's so. Okay. And if it is, I buy you lunch. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> Who's buying the plane ticket? That's a different problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll get around that anyway somehow. Yeah. So h how many iPhones are enough iPhones? Oh, well, if I was to look at the drawer in my desk here, um, the amount of iPhones that are there going back over the years um, that simply just get relegated or get reused or repurposed, um, I would say... 12. Okay. But how many to launch in one year, do you suppose? Uh, to launch in one year, okay, his, going by historical data and what's happened over the last few years with Apple, I would say four iPhones in a year is enough. Okay. And that makes mm. sense. If we look at things like iPhone 5, where we had the 5C launch in the same year, or we look at the uh, the the six and the SE years, that that sounds reasonable. But what if we had six different models total in 2020? I okay. My own personal view on that is, <clears throat> it's too much. I actually think if you overload people with choice, mm. then they're going to get confused and they're not going to know which one to buy. Yeah, that's paralysis kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So six, I think, might be uh, might be pushing it. 
Okay. So let's let's think about what the numbers are here, right? There's mm-hmm. there's the discussion of the possibility of two iPhone SE models coming in 2020. Coming in 2020. It's the so two, iPhone two SE models. 2 and okay. that uh, let's listen. Okay, so there are currently how many OLED phones? Um, Scheduled to be four OLED phones and one LCD model among the iPhone 12 line. Okay, so so what we're going to have and is... And then adding on to that is the iPhone SE 2. Right, so let, let's name them out. So if you've got the, the 12 okay, coming Okay, so, so presume that there's an OLED... Uh, there's there's the LCD 12, there's the okay. OLED 12 Pro, there's the 12 Pro Max, Max, and then there's a phone with 5G in it. Okay, yeah, which is going to be the next above that. So we're we're assuming so that the the standard 12 will not have 5G in it. At least one of the models of 12 will not. There's been some discussion okay. that maybe two of them do, but it's not precisely certain which those are so because poss- well, possibly the pro models get 5g so potentially okay so and on top of that then now uh, we have the iphone se yeah coming in as well mm-hmm. the se2 sorry yeah which may okay, just be called and- iphone se because it's been a discontinued model for some time but so, so here's the thing, right? There's there's these four main iPhone models in the iPhone phone 12 cycle. There's a 4.7 inch LCD iPhone SE2, which is meant to have a form factor similar to the iPhone 8, but that there's also possibly an iPhone SE2 that might be the iPhone SE2 Plus, and that could be either 2020 or the first half of 2021, and that would be using a larger 5.5 or 6.1 inch full screen display, but maybe with and- Touch ID over to the power button side. Okay, and is, uh, the way I view that is, is that kind of not too much of an overlap with your entry level, level 12? Mm-hmm. That you're kind of, you're getting into the same screen size. That it probably will be the same technology, LCD, not OLED. Um, so I kind of think, why, why bring in something that's so similar to the next one? Uh, allow me to explain. So the iPhone SE originally served two different audiences. It served one audience of people who wanted to have a smaller sized screen at any cost because they just liked the smaller form factor. But that's not who it was intended to sell to. What it was intended to do was reuse existing technology because the iPhone SE was more or less part iPhone 6, part iPhone 6S. And it was packaged into the iPhone 5 shell. And the iPhone SE 2, and it was sold like that because packing that that technology into the smaller size case and reusing parts meant that they could offer it a lower price point. And yeah, so you're hitting the emerging markets then. Right. That. So there's been a lot of talk. Well, the emerging markets, the the uh, less economically advantaged, uh, all, all kinds of parts of that. Right. The the, the quote that Tim Cook had at the time when they launched that model was that um, if they were going to be cannibalized, they'd rather cannibalize themselves. Yeah, correct. Yeah, And the, the point of this model is very much to reach the price point because they've, they've suffered criticism that price points are going higher, price points are going higher. Never mind that in the last episode or two episodes ago, I kind of pointed out that accepting the highest end devices, that they were more or less the same they crept up a little bit but and then even crept back down over time yeah so the your entry level iphone is still as cheap as it was when you first got it as as about the iphone 6 or 6s yeah prices haven't gone up precipitously from then the the iphone se2 the uh, should be lower priced and and because besides it's using an iPhone 8-like screen and Touch ID, which are, of course, things that they have done for years now and are affordable, and they know the costs and have cost reduced those as much as they can, it will have an A13 processor with about 3 gig of application RAM and um, 
that will add the glass back design and the wireless charging support of the iPhone 8. But it's using basically the processor that we're using this year. Okay. And not the A14 processor that would be coming in 2020. Well, that just that makes sense, just in terms of uh, scale, production scaling. It's, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, it's production scale, but it's it's also positioned by not using the very newest and fastest, so it's a cost reduced model. And speaking of that, right, the A14 chip is ready to start production. And that's the chip we're going to get next September. Well, yeah. So the A14 chip, TSMC, is is ready to begin manufacturing that chip that's going to be used in that September phone or late 2020 phone, starting in about the second quarter of 2020. Mm. From a production point of view, it would it would have to be ready to be in production now anyway, because for for testing and um, all the different quality control that it has to go through to make sure that everything's ready for. The launch, then yeah, I think it would have to be into into production pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about it is that it's going to be using a five nanometer chip process. Explain that to me, so. Well, so the the current phones that are out there are using a seven nanometer process, and of course, in years past, they were, uh, you know, fifteen nanometers and things like that. And basically, by using the smaller process, you get a lot more logic density in the same amount of space. So the 5 nanometer process offers 1.8 times logic density improvement and a 15% speed gain over the 7 nanometer process. So you're just going to pack a lot more into this? Yes. As if it wasn't fast enough already. Oh, come on. You know you want more. <laughs> We always want more. We you always want, want it faster. More. Yeah. I know you. Yeah. <laughs> but definitely, uh, like each year, Apple really actually, when you look at what they're doing with chip design and the increases that they've done, they're so far ahead of the game over everybody else at the moment. And this obviously is going to take them a fair bit further again. It is. And we keep, we keep talking about the idea of an ARM based MacBook, of an A, A series chip based MacBook. And for single-threaded power, they're already outstripping the Intel-based Macs. It's just with the multi-core that, that it's not quite keeping up. So it's interesting. It's really could, interesting to me when we see this stuff. Could could this be the one that gets it nearly there? That kind of it's too hard to there. predict. We've been calling it for some time, and just saying that this is the one is a little difficult. But TSMC is the sole supplier of these chips. And as much as two thirds of their capacity is going to be used for making iPhone chips. And that puts them in a, a bit of a precarious position if they're relying on that much. It's an interesting position, and you know we should talk about this because remember Imagination Technologies. They're uh, they they were a British firm, and they provided all of the GPU design for iPhones for quite a long some time. And in 2017, Imagination announced that Apple planned to stop using their IP in their hardware designs by 2019. They were heavily reliant on revenue from Apple. Yeah, they, it was almost their sole source of revenue, and it, it basically just wiped them off the map. Pretty much. They, they were responsible for $81 million in 2017, and Apple's pullout... The stock plummeted. They they struggled to stay alive. They entered a dispute resolution process where they accused Apple of unauthorized use of their IP. Um, they they ended up selling themselves to a China backed equity firm. Uh, it's it's been very difficult for them. So it's interesting to note that Imagination announced that they've got a uh, a a licensing agreement with Apple now. It's not clear what IP is involved, but they they have an agreement in place, according to Imagination's website. It's uh, to pay out licensing fees for multi-year rights to a wider range of the British firm's IP. Yeah, but it just means that overall, they're basically a shell of what they formerly were. Oh, absolutely. The The 
Power VR is not the GPU inside the new iPhone by any by any stretch, and so Apple can can make or break a company. Now, obviously, Apple's not going to get rid of TSMC wholesale. In the past, they've used TSMC and Samsung and run them side by side, and that way, if there was a difficulty in supply with one, they could switch to the other. Yeah, which was similar as they did with the Intel and Qualcomm modems. Yes. And, yeah, and actually, the 5G modems are going to be Qualcomm modems again. Yeah, yeah, because Intel have really bowed out of that market. Well, Intel sold the group to Apple. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so by 2023 or so, we should start seeing Apple's modems built into these things. Okay, so if Apple are going to go that way with their modems, what's to say that they don't do something similar to TSMC? Or like, what what's stopping them from... From, well, from so this is it. Is the, the A-series chip is Apple's IP manufactured by TSMC. Apple is a fabless company. That is, they don't own any fabrication plants for this themselves. They take their designs and have them produced by companies who do have fabs. And this is a huge cost savings for Apple in that they don't have to pay directly for all of the retooling to change processes. You know, looking back in history, Intel and AMD... AMD was the the competitor processor to Intel for many years, and they were neck and neck for quite some time. And where they they sort of lost their way for a while was with the change to the smaller process because it was huge expense. Yeah, one of the and things they're starting to come back a bit now, aren't they? They are, but one of the things that really kept AMD going in that time was their acquisition of ATI, the graphics chips people. But we might see, we might see AMD coming back oh, strong again. They, they, they seem are, to have they are. sorted. You know, for for years there were people that wanted to see AMD chips in Macs instead of Intel, and that never came to pass. Um, no. Although it certainly could have at any time. I mean, you, you you imagine just as they'd prepared Intel Macs when they were working on PowerPC, they could have easily compiled for AMD in house, almost assuredly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure they had a project running for a couple of years that did the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah, because we we heard about that that they had the project running for a number of years before they announced the Intel Max anyway. So if they had been running on that for a couple of years, there is no doubt that they were running on AMD at the same time as well. Yeah, no. So Apple likes to have dual suppliers because they don't want to be dependent on any one point of failure. And this was a lesson they learned multiple times from both Motorola and IBM. And in terms of supplying PowerPC chips, where Motorola failed to supply a new generation of G4 PowerPC and where IBM singularly failed to deliver a mobile version of the G5. And that's what led us to the, the Intel shift was because Apple doesn't want to be dependent on anyone else's failings. But when Apple owns the technology and is doing it in-house, they're also not dependent on anyone else's failings. Yeah, and historically they've been better at it. Well, they they have been good about acquiring the talent they need to pull it off. Let's say that. Yeah. yeah. And one of the questions that that gets asked from time to time is, how do you learn things, right? How do you how do you go about becoming the kind of talent that you need to be to do these sorts of things? Oh, uh, just searching Google, maybe. Well, that's a good way to start. Uh, but yeah. you know, where where do you learn? How do you learn? Right? How do you find teachers? That's a good question, actually. Um, uh, to find the best teachers, especially when in in your busy in your everyday work, and you want to find the best teachers and want to find the best things, that's a good question. So, MasterClass lets you learn from the best with exclusive access to online classes taught by masters of their craft. You can learn all about game design from Will Wright. You can improve your writing skills from Neil Gaiman or, uh, or learn photography from Anne Leibovitz. With over 60 different instructors across tons of categories, there's literally something for everyone. And what I like about these things is, is that they really are inspiring. You know, when you take the Will Write course, you're actually going to learn about game mechanics and game design. When you take the Neil Gaiman course, you're going to learn about storytelling and how to craft the story and how to build it and how to turn it into something that's that you can write and be published with. And there are people who've done that, who've, who've commented and said that they took these courses 
and are now starting on writing their book or have have uh, wireframed and architected out their game or it's it's really really enlightening to see that that these are courses that actually help you produce something and not just take and learn but not know what comes next so I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every masterclass. And as an Apple Insider podcast listener, you get 15% off the annual All Access Pass. Go to masterclass.com slash Apple Insider. That's masterclass.com slash Apple Insider for 15% off masterclass. And learn from the best. And learn from the best. Mm -hmm. Now, we're talking about single suppliers versus dual suppliers and things like that. There's a group called BOE. Okay, I haven't, I hadn't heard about these until you mentioned it earlier on. So please enlighten me on this. See, we're learning here. That's <laughs> what we're here for. We're learning. I'm learning from the best. Oh, nice. So <laughs> you're you're learning from at least the one who's present. I don't know about the best, but China's I hope BOE. I get fifteen off. Yeah, China's BOE is set to become Apple's second largest OLED screen supplier in 2021. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. No, let's let's back up. Their BOE are going to become their second largest screen supplier. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, to me, okay, uh, to me, these guys have just come out of nowhere. So where, where? Well, what so who is here? Apple ordering from presently? Who who have they been using? Uh, Samsung. Samsung. LG. LG. Yeah. Okay. Um, Apple is I reportedly don't... planning to order OLED screens from BOE during 2020. Now, we don't know if these are an initial test run, if they'll be used in iPhone 12, or if they'll be used in, well, actually, they, they would have to be used in iPhone 12. They're, they're, um, they're OLED screens, so they, they wouldn't be production for an SE2 or anything like that. This report comes from RPRNA, and it says that reports in the South Korean media say that the order will make BOE the second largest supplier of OLED screens for the iPhone. It says that Samsung will continue to make most of the panels with LG display dropping to third place. Now, RPRNA has no real track record in reporting Apple-related rumors. Um, these claims kind of line up with previous reports that we've heard of BOE's ambitions to become an iPhone OLED manufacturer. BOE is not confined to Apple, though. They, they also supply to Huawei. And we know okay. that Apple likes to diversify which manufacturers it uses. Yeah. Now, they originally, so, they, they used Samsung for OLED displays originally because Samsung was the only game in town that could supply them with the quality required. Correct. And that, that's what I was just about to ask is, what, like, if this company are kind of, okay, to me, they're coming, coming out of nowhere. And it's another case of Apple making a company by by having their announcing them as a supplier where is the I, I presume apple have done the quality control on this but at the same time it's a big shift it's a big step to take i mean to be clear apple haven't announced anyone as a supplier because apple never does yeah but but suppliers will sometimes let on that they're doing it yeah um a apple is critically dependent upon an oled screen it, it, they just are. The okay. whole product is based around having an OLED display. Yeah. So yes, they need them. And yes, this is a part that they aren't manufacturing themselves, and therefore they need to have a dual supplier so that they aren't dependent upon one. Okay. You know, if, if Samsung is the sole supplier and Samsung decides they need to shift orders for Samsung Galaxy 20s or whatever they are, which is the rumored name yeah. for the new Samsung Galaxy, um, that could hurt Apple. Apple needs to not be dependent upon Samsung, even though that hasn't been how the supply relationship has worked. Uh, where where Apple's placed orders, Samsung has happily sold them the parts and done the fabrication for them, even though they've competed on the actual end product. Yeah. It's a risk. Not a big risk, but a risk. They added LG display, and LG initially had real problems producing to the quality level. Yes, I remember that at the time, and it was... Uh, th th could they be going into this, something similar again here now? Well, they, they, I mean, it's possible. As you say, we don't know what at all the quality looks like. Um, mm -hmm. Apple had been investing in Japan Display. But yeah, but that, it's only so many times you can bail someone out. Well, and Japan Display hasn't really pivoted to, to OLED yet. 
they've they've been a leading LCD manufacturer, but where's their OLED production? Yeah, non-existent as such. So this is a real problem, but it comes mm -hmm. down to the the you know this is the the summary. These three pieces: TSMC, imagination, and BOE. Apple can be the kingmaker of you, but at the same time, if if they they turn it off, then where where's your business? Yeah, you have to if if you're going to go down that route, you have to be prepared to, I suppose, beat to their drum. You have to produce what they want, and if you don't, I don't think you get a second bite of the cherry, really. Well, they they do switch suppliers back and forth a little bit, but if you've if you've really disappointed them, then yeah, probably takes yeah. you out of the running. Yeah, you know the TSMC mm. devoting two thirds of their production to Apple. I'm I'm sure that sounds wonderful from a profit perspective and from a stock perspective for TSMC, but it yeah. just seems scary to me. Yeah. Well, I, I if it was me, I would prefer to be given the chance to do it rather than never given the chance. Mm -hmm. I'd prefer to go for it and see. And yeah, I I have so. lived in this kind of thing in the past. Where so years and years and years ago, I worked for a company that made products that worked with Mac, and we were in the Apple store. And 60% of our business came from sales through the retail Apple store. And 60%. 60%. Okay. And one day that turned off based on a decision by Phil Schiller. They just stopped stocking the products. And sent it all back. Oh. Okay. So what, what effect did that have? How did that happen? It how ended did that the company out? is what it did. <laughs> Shut oh. it down promptly. <laughs> wow. Okay, um, but while it was running, while you had that deal in place, I assume it was quite lucrative. It was it was very nice while it lasted, but the problem yeah. is that no one prepares for when that ends. Mm. You you are yeah. constantly working on how you grow or how you build the next thing, not what are you going to do when this all comes to an end. Yes, that's, that's right. true. That is usually the focus, yeah. Yeah, no, you, you have to be constantly focused on what you're going to do that's bigger and better and more and, and not how are we going to build a war chest to survive a rainy day. And so mm -hmm. when, when that bad day comes, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, no, I, I still take the view I'd prefer to have the shot at it. I'd prefer the crack of the whip. <laughs> All right. Well, we've talked a little bit about mobile. What 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 are wireless providers like where you are? Um, actually, the, in Ireland, the coverage is pretty good. We've actually got a, a fairly decent coverage um, in in terms of reception. Uh, cost wise, it varies um, because we don't have as much competition as yourselves. We you're kind of you're kind of locked in to a certain price range. There have been a few uh, a few low price ones in the market recently, all right, and they seem to be doing quite well. Uh, they're mainly targeted at kind of the younger audience, should we say, younger generation. Hmm. But when you go with a low cost provider, do you have to sacrifice features and and you know data allowances and things like that? Um, not some of them you do, some of them you do, but a lot of them are getting much better over here. The I I suppose the 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 different uh, packages that are offered are, are going quite heavily towards data these days now anyway. Yeah. Mm. So in the U.S., we have four major carriers, two of which are attempting to merge at the moment, T-Mobile and Sprint. Yeah. And it's, it's a difficult market. It really, if you're a customer and trying to find a good deal and a good arrangement, it, it's sometimes difficult. If you're still using one of the big wireless providers this year, you have to ask yourself, what are you paying for? So there are expensive retail stores, there are inflated prices and hidden fees, and and you're being taken advantage of because you they, they know you'll pay. Enter Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network covers you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything else is online. They save on retail locations and overhead and then pass those savings directly on to you. And it's really, really nice because you you literally don't have to talk to anyone or go into a store or 
or wait 45 minutes while they activate a phone or any of this stuff. You simply handle it all through the browser. It's, it's a really fluid experience. It's really easy. And it makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just $15 a month. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. And with Mint Mobile, stop paying for unlimited data you'll never use because you choose between plans with 3, 8, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. You use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan, and you keep your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Ditch your old wireless bill and start saving with Mint Mobile. And, and one of the cool things is you can switch between those data plans at pretty much any time, so you're always using what you need to use and, and never paying for more you aren't or, or never undersized. It really works well. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash appleinsider. That's mintmobile.com slash appleinsider. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash appleinsider. And I should point out, it works with visual voicemail on iPhone, which is a real treat. I wonder, will they launch over here pretty soon? That is a good question, and I can certainly ask them about that. Too, please. I'd love it. that. That sounds like the perfect deal. Yeah. Do you have mobile virtual network operators over there? Uh, we have a few, all right, yeah. 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 Okay. Mm. So that's something yeah, to so. explore. I'll tell them. Yeah. Do you have a problem with robocalling over there? And uh, not, not in the same way as it happens in the states. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the calls we get are from uh, foreign numbers that. Uh, tend to kind of it calls you for a minute or two or no well not even a minute calls you for maybe like 10 seconds and then hangs up so that you appear as though you have a missed call on your phone but if you go to call it back it's a premium rate foreign number ah. so they're they're relying on you looking at your phone and go oh who was looking at for me from abroad and then phoning back um, but we don't have the same issues that in the US of the actual the sales targeted robocalls. calls yeah mm. so we have we have constantly sales targeted ro ro robo calls this is the uh this is kate from account services there's not a problem with your visa card but we need you to call us back right now or the um this is the irs calling the internal revenue service calling and mm. we are going to send someone to arrest you if you don't call us right back which of course is completely fraudulent or yeah. the uh you're eligible for an open enrollment in healthcare. And, and of course you aren't and no, there isn't, but what's really problematic is that these, these calls are of course recordings. They're, they're not real people unless you stay online long enough to get a real person and they spoof the phone numbers. The, the number, you know, I've, I've had people call me back and say, why did you call me? Well, I didn't call you, sir, but I got, got a call from your number. What are you trying to sell me? Nothing, sir. <laughs> and it's, it's a real, real problem. And you know, most of the phone calls that I get are these kinds of calls. So there is now a, a bill that has been signed into law, and it, it had nearly bipartisan support in both the Senate and the House of Representatives in the United States. The legislation requires that carriers implement authentication technology to combat calls number spoofing. So all those people using my number will be required to stop. Uh, because the calls will be authenticated. They'll also be required to offer call blocking services for users so that people can block those calls for free. Previously, AT&T and Verizon and 10 other companies promised to implement authentication procedures, and they have offered call blocking, but at a cost. Now they're going to be required by law to offer it for free as a part of their, their dealings. Um, and is this going to... Is this going to this is obviously going to help with stuff that's happening internally in the US? Um, will it affect or will it be able to help, especially the, the call blocking service anyway, with the, the foreign calls that are coming in? Well, I don't know if so. That's an interesting question. The authentication appears to really address spoof numbers. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily, it may have a knock-on effect for combating uh, foreign numbers that aren't legit, but the blocking service will block those numbers. Okay. Will allow users to block those numbers. Okay, well, it, it's, it's a good step forward anyway. Every, every step that's taken towards 
reducing spam, whether it's by phone or by email, every step that's taken is a good step. Yeah, I, I expect that the user blocking, especially if it's one by one and without the ability to automate or without the ability to use shared lists to block, it will be a, a whack-a-mole project. You, you yeah. block one, another pops up kind of problem. But the authentication can only help. Yes, yes. Well, historically, the design of telephone systems and email did not take into account any of these abuses that are, were going to happen later on in in, in time. And um, I suppose authentication is the way around it. All this should be done by authentication. It, it really has to be. I mean, we, as you say, none of this was designed in. No. It was designed no, to be as permissive as possible. In fact, it was designed without, I mean, initially what we had operators and then we had, and you could just choose two alligator clips and clip a line anywhere and pick up and get a dial tone. Yeah. You know, it's it's changed and grown quite a lot. Yeah. So, yeah, every step, authentication definitely is, is the way to go forward with all these systems anyway. And, um, yeah, every step forward, I'm all, for, I'm all in for it. Now, Jimmy Iving, I talked about him at the beginning of the show a little bit when you were talking about Apple TV Plus and streaming services. So... Ivan says that streaming services face the same problems, but their their problems are about differentiation. You know, you're saying that Apple TV Plus needs to go ahead and syndicate content to have more content there, and the the music services pretty much all have about the same artists on them, and so differentiation becomes difficult. Yeah. Now, I know when I said about that, <clears throat> I kind of made the comparison of of launching your TV service without TV streaming service without loads of content into it is like launching a, a music streaming service. Now, I, I do realize that there is a fairly significant difference in, in how both are consumed. Mm -hmm. And the, so it's not an exact comparison. But at the same time, yeah, at the moment, the streaming, all the music streaming services are all basically doing the exact same thing. There is, yeah, and, and no one, the, none of the streaming services are doing like the movie services. None of them are producing their own content. Right. And Ivan had Interscope Records, and there was a, a time period where people really cared about what record label someone was on and, and associated that record label with good artists, right? And yeah, that's gone. That's well gone. But the... Uh, <clears throat> He, he sort of still remembers it and thinks about it similar to, hey, he says, you know, record companies no longer have a direct relationship with music consumers. Mm. And, yeah. you know, this is, this is great for artists because they now have massive direct communication with their audience. But as a record company, you'd almost want to launch, you know, what I'm drawing from his comments, he doesn't say this, but I'm sort of getting there is he says, look what's working in video. Disney Plus has only original content. So... He, I think he's imagining what if Interscope had their own streaming service? What if Sub Pop had their own streaming service kind of thing? Because then you'd have different original content at different things. Yeah, but I don't think that's what the consumer wants. No, not at all. The consumer doesn't want to have to subscribe to all these different to get their content. Absolutely not. Mm. But, but you know, I Ivan says hail to the artists because they're winning. It isn't their problem to figure out how the streaming company and the record company are going to make more money. It's, it's the streaming company's job to figure that out, how to become more valuable to the artist, especially if the artist has that direct communication with their audience. But are the artists winning at the moment? From well, what I've heard, so, they're not. Well, you know, when I talked with, I talked with two artists over the summer. No, last, last spring. And one of them was... Uh, was was uh, from Blondie. He was the keyboard player from Blondie who knew Jimmy Iovine. And okay. he said that the streaming services were fantastic, that he loves the streaming services because he's getting royalties that he would never have gotten before. That in the past, without streaming services, it would have been up to the record company to decide to re-release an album or make something available again from back catalog and then he would get a little bit of royalty and that was it. But with streaming he's getting tons of royalties he would never have gotten in the past that he loves streaming. Now I talked with a young artist 
who had never experienced the old way and, and was disappointed that their royalties weren't big enough. But So it's down to perspective, really. So. A little bit, yeah. Now, is, is Ivan just actually like doing what the record companies or the record industry has, or the music industry has done for the last few years and contingently look back at how it was and is wishing on the good old days without actually embracing the new way? So I don't know that he is. I think, so I, I, Iovine is a little bit different from some of the rest of the people in the music industry. And, you know, when, when there was this period of time where the record industry was using the, the law in the U.S. to sue listeners. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they had this thing called Napster way back when. And Napster was file sharing for music. And there were other services too. Yeah. But uh, it, it really opened up the ability for people. And it came right at the same time as MP3 basically started to become popular. Or maybe it popularized MP3. And it allowed people to share files and share music like never before. Yeah. And and there were other services that followed that did the same thing. And the record company's response was to sue the oblivion out of the consumer. Yeah, and I think um, Steve Jobs' response was to launch iTunes with a 99-cent deal and pretty yeah. much did away with Napster. <laughs> for, well, Napster was going yeah. down before that time. But but yes, he did away with all this other file yeah. sharing for the most he part. The, he put the fi final nail in the coffin. Absolutely. He convinced the record industry to actually say, no, this should be your pricing model. Right. Mm. And the, the the thing that I have been says is, you know, the response was to sue the, the, was to get rid of the tech and to sue the tech and tech was the enemy. And I have been says, when I got into the music business was to be associated with things that were cool. And the record business at that moment was not cool. The way it was responding to Napster was not cool. And mm. so... I think what Iveen says there is is you have to take advantage of this new technology. You have to find ways to to make profit within it and with it. And that uh, just 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 trying to keep things at one point in time doesn't work. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much standard for any industry. <laughs> it is, but so many of them try to use copyright law to turn back the clock. You know the uh, yeah. the VCR was supposed to be was compared to the Boston Strangler. In in you know that this would be mm -hmm. the death of the movie industry. VCR was going oh. to kill the movie industry, and it yeah. didn't happen. No, no, made it made a lot of music company or, or um, it it made the movie industry TV actually companies, yeah. better. Yeah, right. It yeah, it allowed there was Disney a lot to of... resell everything from the vault. <laughs> Yeah, and there was a lot of TV uh, production companies that came up as just straight to VHS companies. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. Yeah. So Apple is researching a HomePod audio solution for future MacBook Pro. This comes from a patent filing that describes audio signal processing for virtual acoustics that, that can enhance a movie, sports, or video game, or other viewing experience. So it's going to use the same technology in the HomePod on your MacBook. Right. So what they're they're talking about doing is just as they can use the HomePod to psychoacoustically make the sound come from another area, yeah. put that in the MacBook, and now you can have virtual audio sources to to make the sound feel like you've got a wider stereo spread or or locate more more accurately the the sound in a video game. Okay, so, well, this on the um, on the MacBook, this sounds like a great idea because you've got a one-to-one -one experience there. If you are gaming or doing something with VR, then if you can do this, then it means that the audio is coming from where you think it should be coming from. Yeah, like you know, behind you to the left or above you, that kind of thing. So, and they're obviously going to use the same uh, beaming audio beaming mm -hmm. uh, technology. No, building that into a MacBook Pro is going to be quite a feat. Definitely. And yeah. there's there's also some headphone filings, which, you know, with, uh, with in terms of this kind of thing, they need to be able to do wave cancellation in the air surrounding the listener, and you can't really do that with headphones. It's something yeah. that works with loudspeakers. But 
there is a headphone filing that as well that talks about headphones that can detect whether they're placed in the left or right ear. Okay, yeah. Which means that then they can assign the audio based on that. Yeah, okay. Well, they could they could kind of do that now anyway, considering if they just assume that you have the headphones in the right ear, they could do that kind of audio forming now anyway in your headphones. A little bit, but it's yeah. it's just... Sometimes patents aren't filed by what they're going to actually produce, but by something that's just an interesting method that they want to patent. Yeah. This sounds like very good, though, with the Mac Pros, if they're, if they're going to do something like that. It's, um, it'll, it'll be good for, for the VR and any kind of augmented reality or gaming. That's going to be a, a big step up. Absolutely. So on, at the end of last year, December 27th, just days ago, Apple amended a lawsuit that they'd filed versus a company called Corellium. Corellium provides the frameworks for an iOS simulator that gets used a lot by security researchers. And what's, what's going on there is that Apple is trying to block this tool using the Copyright Act. Um, Apple's filing says this is a straightforward case of infringement of highly valuable copyrighted works, along with the trafficking and profiting from technology that enables such infringement. Corellium, the company that they're suing here, uh, their hmm. business is based entirely on commercializing the illegal replication of the copyrighted operating system and applications that run on Apple's iPhone, iPad, and other devices. The product that Corellium offers is a virtual version of Apple's mobile hardware products accessible to anyone with a web browser. Specifically, they serve up what it touts as a perfect digital facsimile of a broad range of Apple's market-leading devices, recreating with fastidious attention to detail not just the way the operating system and applications appear visually, but also the underlying computer code. And Corellium does so with no license or permission from Apple. Apple also says, so security researchers are using this. Yeah, I, I've hold kind on. of got, I, I'm down the middle on this one. I, re, I really, I've, I've, I've had a hard time as I've been following this. I've had a hard time kind of making up my mind on who I'm behind on this. I, yeah. I kind of see, well, I suppose for developers and security researchers, I see it as it's a good thing that this tool is there for them. Yeah. From Apple's point of view, then yeah, it's it's uh, it's copyright infringement. So right. So from Apple's point of view, that this thing even exists is copyright infringement. But the security researchers are using it to test jailbreaks and to find holes and flaws in iOS, which only improves the security of iOS. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. And. So the, the Corellium response is that we're deeply disappointed by Apple's persistent demonization of jailbreaking. Across the industry, developers and researchers rely on jailbreaks to test the security of both their own apps and third-party apps, testing which cannot be done without a jailbroken device. Uh, for example, a recent analysis of the Tutok app revealed that an yes. Apple-approved chat app was being used as a spying tool by the government of the United Arab Emirates. And according to the researchers behind this analysis, this would not have been possible without the jailbreak. Yeah, and Apple seems quite happy with some of the some of the reports and some of the the security bugs that were found mm -hmm. to take that information at the time, but now don't seem to want to support this tool. So, I I think Apple should be looking at a different taking this as a different approach to this. Instead of taking a legal fight to them, they need to come up to some agreement with them and say, okay, like let's make you an official licensed partner on this. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that they, you know, if if the need is to have jailbroken devices as opposed to a uh, a web-based system, then Apple could create a program that allowed a small number of jailbroken devices to be made available to security developers. Yes. Hmm. But then again, they probably don't need that program because well, people and. Can People will always find a way to jailbreak their devices anyway. Uh, it, it's well that the whole point of it is that it's getting harder to do that. Yeah. If you need the device to already be jailbroken in order to do the security research to find out about these other problems, then you know you're you're just making additional steps. Yeah. Yeah. I I can understand Apple's point of view that the, this isn't an official system and it probably slipped under the radar for a certain length of time and they're. Probably looking down the road now and saying, "Okay, this could become an issue if we leave it there." Mm -hmm. But I, I well, what's interesting is that Corellium claims that Apple encouraged Corellium to develop this. Ah, 
that Corellium was also approved to take part in the invitation-only security bounty program. Okay, well, that changes the game a bit. You can't invite someone in and then complain that they're there. It's it's interesting. So hmm. we will we will monitor this. We will see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's going to be an interesting one. It is. Well, mm-hmm. that's all the time we have. Oh, we have run out of time. Very quick. We we have wow. it has. <laughs> okay, it has been a pleasure, Victor. I am so glad you were here for this. Thank you so much for joining us. No problem, and I hope I come back again sometime. Um, maybe after Brexit, William can be the UK representative and I be the EU representative. <laughs> we'll see. And and no matter how that plays out, we'll find out here on the Apple Insider podcast. I'm Victor. You can find me at VMarks on Twitter and Victor at AppleInsider.com. And, and Sean, where can people find you? Um, you can get me on Twitter at Shawnee248. And you can also email me at Sean at Eli.net. Fantastic. Well, it's been so much fun having you here. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back next week.